Well, if you've been with us from 1 Samuel through 2 Samuel, two years, you've been with us through 55 chapters of the majority of it being the, the life of David. You've been with us through not just 55 chapters, but you've been with us through 45 sermons, 45 messages. You've been with us through 130 years of Israelite history from the birth of Samuel all the way through the end of David's reign. And you've been with us through battles and wars and fights and David running for his life and everything else that has taken place. And yet there's been one constant through all of that. And that's been that we've looked at one unchangeable, immutable, holy God that's been over and ordaining all of it. And part of that sovereignty of God that we can appreciate is God inspired this story and these events and this man's life to be recorded for you and I for today. As the New Testament says in Corinthians and elsewhere, these were written down for our instruction. And so that's why we've given ourselves two years and 45 sermons and 55 chapters and 130 years of Israelite history. That's why we've given all of our attention to this is because the Lord has put it down and, and put it down for all time so that we would be able to learn lessons from David's life and from the life of those that he interacts with. And that's what I want us to do this morning as we reflect back on David's life is to just draw out at least three lessons. And they may be different from lessons that you've learned from David's life. And later on during a small group, you'll have an opportunity uh, to talk about how this study and how David's life has impacted you specifically. But these are three lessons that I feel like are pretty universally applicable for us uh, that I've drawn out through our time together in 2 Samuel and also in 1 Samuel. And that's where I want us to start is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'll read it for you, verse 11 through 13. says this, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, we'll send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is obviously the, the anointing of, Sam, of, of David by Samuel. This is after the rejection of Saul, after 1 Samuel 15, where Saul had not executed the, uh, the Amalekites. He had not fulfilled God's command to go and wipe out all of the Amalekites, but he had left Agag. And you remember that interaction between Saul and, and Samuel. And Saul says, well, well, I've done what the Lord commanded. And Samuel said, well, why am I hearing sheep in the background? And why did you not execute Agag? And now God has rejected Saul and sent Samuel to anoint David. And Samuel has gone here in 1 Samuel chapter 16 to Jesse's home. And he went through all of Jesse's boys and he said, Where's, don't you have any more? And Jesse said, well, sure, there's one, but you don't want him. He's out keeping the sheep. And Samuel said, no, call him. We're not going forward with anything else until David shows up. And so David comes in. God tells Samuel, this is the one. Samuel anoints David in what was not a, a, a wide, widely public anointing, but it was in front of all of his brothers in his father's household. And in other words, David understood what was going on. He understood that he was being anointed to be the next king of Israel. But from that time until he ascended the throne, that time until he was finally the king, not just over Judah, but over Judah and the tribes in the north as well, over 20 years would pass. 20 years of, of David serving under Saul in, in some better times, maybe at the beginning of that. 20 years, though, of, of tension between David and Saul at times. 20 years of David running, eventually, from Saul. 20 years of David keeping company. You remember the description of the mighty men with the societal outcast, with those who had no place anymore in Jerusalem, no place anymore in Judah, no place anymore, not in Jerusalem because that wasn't a, an Israelite city at the time, but you know what I mean, no place in Israel anymore. And they went to David, 20 years of running with those guys, 20 years of hiding in caves, 20 years of scrounging for whatever food and water that they could find. 20 years not knowing what tomorrow held. 20 years, some of that even spent behind enemy lines with the Philistines. 20 years not having a, a, an end in sight, no guaranteed inauguration day for David, and yet he had this promise back in 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel chapter 16. 
that God had anointed him to be the next king of Israel, that God had set aside Saul and Saul's household and David was going to be the next king of Israel. And what we see from David throughout that 20 plus years running and facing trial after trial and difficulty after difficulty is we see an admirable patience in the life of David. Something that we should all aspire to. And yet, how often do we become impatient waiting on the promises of the Lord? after just a matter of days of going through a a tough time or weeks or or even months of going through a tough time. But 20 plus years, maybe some of you in this room have gone through 20 plus years of difficulty and you have remained faithful. And I would say, praise God, that's, that's a great testimony to his grace at work in your life. But for most of us, When we encounter just a a week's worth of trial, we start to feel our bodies break down and get sick and we immediately what? We start grumbling and complaining, don't we? We're like the Israelites in the wilderness far more than we're like David in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 11, it says this, they said to Moses, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So often we read of the account of the Exodus and the Israelites in the wilderness and grumbling and complaining against God. And we say, do you not understand what you've been through? Do you not see that God raised up a shepherd from the middle of nowhere in Moses and brought him to you and overcame the most powerful man in the known world at the time in Pharaoh? to set you free? Do you not understand that you were led through the Red Sea and that was not a natural phenomenon, but that was a miracle of God because the ground that you walked across was dry? Did you not see the waters rush back on the the Egyptian army? Have you not seen how God has provided for you? Why are you grumbling? Why are you complaining? And so often we can read through the story of the Exodus and we can point the finger at Israel not realizing that so often we are more like Israel than we're comfortable with. When things don't go well in our our lives, when our plans don't work out, we can be more like Israel in the wilderness than David in the wilderness. I know that's my inclination. When I want something that's out of my reach, when I want immediate gratification, when I want my plans to work out according to my timetable and not the Lord's timetable, my default is to shift back to Israel in the wilderness. My default is to shift to not patiently trusting the Lord, but grumbling against the Lord. And that's a lesson that I need to learn from David's life. It's point number one for us this morning. It's this, patiently trust in the Lord's plans. Patiently trust in the Lord's plans. I think the reason this is so difficult for us at times is because we don't have a high enough view of the good that awaits for us through the unfolding of these plans. We've tasted the the good things that this world has to offer us. And we say, well, yes, that's what I want. That's what I need. That's what's good for me. We've experienced the the fleeting temporal pleasures and our minds have deceived us into thinking that, that that's the greatest thing that could be possibly had for us. And so we grumble and complain when we don't have the world's pleasures, when we don't have the, the temporal pleasures. We grumble and complain when we experience discomfort because we don't understand that all the while God is working together things for our good and it's a good that's gonna surpass anything that this world has to offer us. So often we act impulsively because we think, well, it's, it's, good for me. It's good for my family. So it must be good according to the plan and will of God, but that's not always going to be the case. Think of David's patience when he was in the cave at En Gedi in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Saul was right there in his grasp in a very vulnerable position. Yes. And David had all 400 of his mighty men behind him in the cave saying, this is the day. And notice what they said to him. Remember what they said to him. They said, the Lord has delivered him into your hand this day. But that wasn't true, was it? 
Because David didn't reach out and strike Saul. And why didn't David reach out and strike Saul? Because David knew that to do so would be to sin against God, would be to raise his hand against the Lord's anointed, something that the, the Lord had forbidden. And so David knew that this was not his moment to take things into his own hands. David knew that this wasn't his moment to act impulsively for what his flesh, I'm sure, was saying, well, this would be my good. No more running, no more hiding. I would have the throne. My men could go back home. And yet David remained patient and trusted the Lord and followed the Lord's will rather than his own will. Two chapters later, in 1 Samuel chapter 26, David and Abishai go into the camp of the, the Israelites that are pursuing them and they find Saul and Abner asleep. You remember this story? And Abishai picks up the spear and he says, allow me to, to strike him. I will not miss. And even Abishai again says, the Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands this day. And yet again, David follows God's plans, follows God's revealed will and understands that it's never part of God's plan for us to sin in order to, to accomplish our own good or something that will be beneficial to us. And so David says to Abishai, no, we're not going to do this. And they take the spear and they take the water jug and they leave. The, the patience of David there, when he had an opportunity to take things into his own hands, it's a patience that we need to exercise as well. As well. When circumstances and events show up in our lives, maybe it's a, a promotion at work that on the surface you think, well, this is great for me. This is great for my family. It's going to put me in a, a position with more authority, with more power, with more clout, and probably most importantly, more dollar signs involved. Why wouldn't I take this promotion? But let me encourage you to at least stop and, and push away from the table. And we've talked about this through this study, right? And seek the Lord's will. Is this Lord really what you want for me? Is this your definition of what's good for me and not just my definition of what's good for me? Or maybe it's even just in our conversations with one another. How quickly does a, an impulsive thought come into our mind and we don't stop to think, okay, is this something that's going to be beneficial is this something that's going to be honoring to the Lord? Is this something that's going to be pleasing to the Lord for me to say this? Or do I need to just go ahead and let that thought fade away as quickly as it came into mind? David modeled this patient trust in, in the Lord's plan. For some of you, you look around at the world and you see the, the world enjoying the, the fleeting pleasures of our life, right? In, enjoying the fleeting pleasures of, of sinfulness all around us. And it's tempting and there's a struggle, there's a battle there that we don't like to wait on what the Lord has provided for us because we don't, we don't wanna feel so restricted. We don't wanna feel so confined. Let me remind you though of Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611 where David would write there, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. As we encounter this world's definition of what is good and the temptations out there. And our temptation may be to, to reach for immediate gratification or to reach for what we define as good rather than what the Lord defines as good. We need to remember a verse like Psalm 16, 11 and discipline ourselves to, to think about and remember that the good that the Lord has prepared for us in the future is far better than anything that this world could offer us in the here and now. And we must remain patient and trust in the Lord's plan that he is working things together for our good, for that good. Or maybe it's Romans 8, verses 18 and following. Maybe some of you are, are suffering right now, walking through the valley right now, walking through trials and tribulation. You, you're empathizing. You can relate to where David is when David's on the run for his life from Saul, where David is being hunted down for nothing that David has done other than being anointed by the Lord. And, and you can relate to that. And you're, you've been praying for deliverance. You've been praying for provision. You've been praying for relief. And yet you've continued to remain in this valley. You've continued to remain in this period of suffering. And, and your question is, Lord, what are you doing? Why won't you deliver me? And it's growing harder and harder and harder to remain patient and trust in the Lord's plan where you're at. But let me remind you of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and following when he said, I consider the sufferings of this pleasant, present age are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. And then he talks after that about creation groaning for that day. And then he says, we groan with creation for that day. So as you groan, groan in patience, remembering what Paul is saying here, that there is a day that's coming when the, the suffering that you are enduring, when the trial that you are walking through right now will be gone, will be over. It may not be this side of heaven, but that day is coming. And when that day comes, you're going to look back on that trial and you're going to be able to say with Paul, it was light 
momentary affliction. David was clearly not a name it and claim it theologian. He was a God said it and I'm gonna wait for it theologian. But that doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? Again, we know God's promise, right? Romans chapter eight, that he is working all things according to what? Our good. The problem is so often we want to define our good, but that's not our prerogative. He's working all things according to our good, according to his definition of good, yes? And his definition of good is given to us in verse 29, that we should be conformed to the image of Christ. And so everything in our life, he is working together for that end to conform us to the image of Christ, which gives us the comfort to wait patiently, knowing that our suffering is not without reason, without cause, without, without a, a, a good behind it, without a purpose that God is working in our lives through it. And knowing that that good that awaits us is gonna be far better than any good that this world could offer us. Well, David's patience revealed a, a deep-seated devotion to the Lord in his life. Consider 2 Samuel now, chapter one, verses 13 through 16. This is right on the heels of David finding out that Saul, his mortal enemy, the one that had been chasing him, the one that had been pursuing him for so long, that Saul had died in battle on Mount Gilboa in the battle with the, the Philistines. And we might think that David's response would be finally, right? We might think that David's response would be to think about, I don't have to run anymore. I can go back to Jerusalem. I can go back to the the priestly system, I can go back to worshiping the Lord the way that uh, I, I used to worship him. I don't have to worry about my life anymore, running for my life. I don't have to worry about where my next meal is gonna come from. These 400 men with me can now go back home. We can return to normalcy and more than that, now I can ascend to the throne that God promised me some 20 plus years ago. I, 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 we can think that, that all of those thoughts may have been running through David's mind and yet his immediate thoughts were for the glory of God. Look at verse 13 of chapter one. And David said to the young man who told him, where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. And David said to him, how is it that you are not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? See the concern for the name of the Lord that David exercises here? I mean, this is a, a monumental occurrence. Let's not get this wrong. From, a, from an earthly perspective, this was a, a, a bit of news that, yes, was bittersweet, but there was so much about this that was sweet news for David and his men. And yet David's first concern is about the glory of God. How can this Gentile, how can this non-Israelite dare to have raised his hand against the Lord's anointed when even David himself would not do that thing? Verse 15, then David called one of the young men and said, go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, your blood be on your own head for your mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. This devotion to the Lord that David exercises here is something that marked his reign, the majority of it at least. Second Samuel chapter five, Israel is going to war against the Philistines. And the Philistines draw up for battle against Israel, but David doesn't charge out for battle. What does David do first? He inquires of the Lord. He's devoted to the Lord. He seeks God's will for this battle. Should we go to battle? The Lord says, yes, go. David leads the army out and they defeat the Philistines. Well, a few days later, the Philistines are back, same spot, same location, ready for battle again. And we talked about this when we preached through this passage. Again, it would have made perfect sense for David to just assume Okay, Lord, you want me to go out to battle against them again? Same way, same, same methodology, and, and you'll work victory. But David, he doesn't make that assumption. He seeks the Lord again in that instance. And it's a good thing he did because the Lord said, don't go out to battle the same way that you did before, but this time wait when you hear the sound of the troops in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle and I will deliver them into your hands. But we see David's devotion to the Lord there. Second Samuel chapter six bringing the ark to Jerusalem. There was the initial slip up, right? When David put the ark on the cart and Uzziah reached out to, or Uzzah reached out to, to steady the, the ark and it, as it was falling and he was struck dead. And David threw a little bit of a, a temper tantrum at that moment and left it behind. But then he found out that good things were happening with the, the keeper of the ark. And so he says, well, you know what? On second thought, let's go back and get the ark. 
But when he goes back to get the ark, what does he do? He shows a, a devotion to the Lord. He has the ark brought back to Jerusalem the way that it was supposed to be transported in the first place, being carried on those poles and not put on an ark like the Gentile Philistines did when they sent it back to Israel. And not only that, he along the way sacrifices the offerings over and over and over again as the ark is passing by. And beyond that, David is leading the procession of the ark, going back into Jerusalem, dancing before the Lord with all of his might, worshiping God as the ark is being brought back to the extent that as he's coming back into the city, Michael, the daughter of Saul, sees David dancing and despises him in her heart and says to the king when he gets back, well, you made a fine show of yourself today, embarrassing yourself in front of all of Israel. And the king says, I'd gladly become more undignified than that in the service of my king, who, by the way, put your dad down and all of his family. You remember that, Michael? Devotion to the Lord. And, and then even in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it didn't work out the way that David was expecting it to, but what did David want to do at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 7? Build the temple. His devotion for the Lord was making him uncomfortable that he was sitting in a palace and the Ark of the Covenant was in a tent. And so he has a devotion for the Lord, a good motive there in 2 Samuel chapter 7 to say, God, I want to build you a house. You deserve something far greater than what I have. And there's a devotion to the Lord. And, and then, yes, we see the, the fall in chapter 11 and the fallout of chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. But we see, as we talked about our last time together, that David was a man who learned from his mistakes who learned from his sins, who had learned through the discipline of the Lord and remained devoted to the Lord so that even when he fell, as we talked about last week, he was quick to return in devotion to the Lord by confessing his sin, by seeking forgiveness and restoration from the Lord. David was clearly a man devoted to the Lord and it's a devotion that we must have as well. In fact, it's imperative to us as followers of God that we have the same devotion. It's point number two for us this morning. It's this, be a devoted follower of Jesus. Be a devoted follower of Jesus. Why would this be so important? Why, in fact, why would I say that it's imperative that we are a devoted follower of Jesus? Well, the answer is because when you look at the way that Jesus describes what it looks like to follow him, if you're not devoted to him, you're not all in in following Christ, you're not committed to Jesus as your absolute Lord and master, then you'll never survive. Listen to some of the descriptions that Jesus gave for what it is to follow him. First, he said this, if anyone wishes to follow me, let him what? Take up his cross. Let him die to himself daily and follow me. That fills us with the warm fuzzies, doesn't it? That fits in with name it and claim it theology, doesn't it? With a life of ease and comfort. No, it flies in the face of all of that. It flies in the face of our flesh, which says, well, I want things to be easy. I want things to be comfortable. For Jesus to say, no, what it means to follow me is to die to yourself daily. He also said this. He said, whoever does not hate his father and mother is not worthy of me. It's a strong statement, one that you'll discuss a little bit more in your discussion questions. But Jesus is basically talking about the fact that our devotion to Christ should make our relationships with every other person in our life look like hatred that we should love him that much. Which also means that no one on earth, no earthly relationship that you have should ever come between your relationship with the Lord. Including your wife. If it ever came down to a point, and heaven forbid it ever would, but if it ever came down to a point where your wife said it's me or God, your answer is easy in that. Sorry, honey, it's the Lord. Jesus also said this, whoever wishes to find his life will what? Lose it. Whoever wishes to be greatest among you should be the servant of all. You see, Jesus cast this picture of what it means to follow him, to be a, a disciple of Jesus. And what he cast for us is not a, a life of ease and comfort. It's a life of difficulty. It's a life that's going to require us to patiently trust in the Lord's plan because it's going to be a life that is swimming upstream against the world and against the world's system. We're not gonna get on those people movers that you have at the airport and just coast our way through this life until we get to glory. 
It's going to be a battle. It's going to be an uphill climb for us. And David modeled this for us so well. And we need to see that and look at his devotion and say, okay, we need that level of devotion to the Lord, that concern for the Lord's glory, that commitment to be faithful to him in in every circumstance that we come across. Because again, the world that we live in is, is not going to foster that. Our society certainly isn't, is it? Think of the conference that we just held here this past weekend. By the Bible and, and human sexuality. Why did we have that conference? Because we live in a world that's taking this concept of what's so clearly defined in the scriptures and twisting it and perverting it and glorifying it and holding it up as what is normal. And now all of a sudden, the church is on the opposite end of the spectrum and we're being looked at and said that we're the ones that are abnormal. We're the ones that are out of line. We're the ones that are wrong. We are are bigoted and narrow-minded and closed-minded. And before too long, we're gonna be called racist for speaking out against homosexuality. What are we gonna do there? Are we gonna bow the knee to the world? Or are we gonna say... This is what's true and I'm gonna hold fast to what's true. Or how about the the abortion laws that are being passed? That now a woman can have a baby, decide I don't want that baby, leave it on the table to die after it's born. It's Molech all over again. Our society is revealing its depravity. Our society is confirming what the scriptures tell us. There's no one righteous, not one. No one who seeks after God. For some of you, your jobs are making it increasingly difficult to be a devoted follower of Jesus. Heard of somebody recently who's in a management position who's having to wrestle with his company, handing down the, uh, the instructions on how he needs to interact with and hire those in the LGBTQ, LMNOP, QRSTUV spectrum. It's no longer, hey, who's the best person for the job? Now it's, we need to have a, a quota. We need to make sure that we are, here's the word, diverse when it comes to our hiring practices. And he's having to comply with these things. Others of you, you are in work environments where you're not allowed to talk about your relationship with Christ. And that those those freedoms to be a believer, to be a devoted follower of Jesus are being increasingly stripped away from us. And the question is, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna respond? Where's the limit that we're willing to put up with? And then after that, we're gonna all of a sudden wonder if it's worth it to stay devoted to Christ. Others of you have families making it difficult to remain a devoted follower of Jesus. Some of you in this room have wives that don't attend church with you. Wives that may be Christians and maybe they go to a different church, but even still, that's, that's difficult not to have that unity together of coming to church on the weekend together. Some of you have wives that aren't believers at all. And that's difficult to be a devoted follower of the Lord to be a godly husband the way that God has called you to be a godly husband, to be a godly father the way that God has called you to be a godly father. Some of you have children who are not following the Lord, which makes it again difficult to be a devoted follower of Christ. Beyond these arenas, there's our flesh, which battles against us in this pursuit that we need to to have to be a devoted follower of Christ. Our lusts in our passions and desires that wage war against the spirit, our idols in our lives that we rush to, that we serve rather than serving and worshiping the Lord. So I asked this this morning, how do these obstacles impact your devotion to Christ? Do they leave you tired, worn out, weary, exhausted, frustrated, angry, hurt? Do they drain you? Do they stagnate your your walk with Christ or on the flip side, do they drive you to Christ? Time and again in the Psalms, David referred to the Lord as the stronghold, the fortress, the rock, the deliverer, shelter, refuge. Why did David refer to the Lord that way so many times? Because David knew what it was to labor against a world that didn't want him to be obedient to the Lord. 
David knew what it was to struggle to be a devoted follower of God. David knew what it was to have to patiently trust in the Lord's plan where that was one of the most uncomfortable positions that he could have ever been in. And yet we need to follow David's example because it drove him to a greater devotion to God. It drove him to the safest place that he could be, which is in service to the Lord, in shelter in the Lord. And you say, well, okay, well, what does that look like? That's pretty amorphous to say, well, take refuge in the Lord or be a devoted follower of Jesus. Let's talk about a few areas that we've hit on quite a few times in our time together through 2 Samuel. The first area is, is your prayer life. To be a devoted follower of Jesus means that you have an active daily prayer life. And not just when you wake up in the morning or when you're going to bed at night, not just at meal times should you be praying, not even just after your, your daily Bible reading, but like the apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing all day long, be in a mindset that you are quick to prayer, that you are always feeling that prompt to go before the Lord, to answer the call of the writer of Hebrews where he says, we can draw near to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Daily, so when it's, it's before that big meeting that you have at work, pray before you go into that meeting. Pray when you're coming out of that meeting. That lunch appointment that you have with a coworker or with a client, pray before going into that meeting. Pray for an opportunity to share the gospel during that meeting. Pray coming out of that meeting. Pray for opportunities just in general in your life to share the gospel throughout the day. Pray when you get in the car, Lord, if it be your will, allow me to arrive safely at my destination. When you show up safely, pray and thank him for, for keeping you safe along the way. Yes, pray when you sit down to a meal and thank him for the food that he's given you. Pray for your wife. Pray for your kids throughout the day. Pray for your brothers in your small group. Pray for your pastors. Pray for our country and our leadership as we're instructed to do as well. Pray without ceasing. This is what it looks like to be a devoted follower of Christ and we need this, man. It's our lifeline. Our savior got up early in the morning after he had been up late the night before in the house of Peter, healing all those who were coming to him, lame, sick, demon possessed. He got up early in the morning. Why? To go out and spend time with his father in prayer. You've heard it said before, I'm sure. If our savior needed that, we need that as well. We need to be a devoted follower of Jesus in that sense. The second thing is, and, and you know where I'm gonna go with this, not just prayer, but also time in the word. The scriptures. To be a devoted follower of Christ, we have to be in the word daily, man. We have to be in the word regularly. And let me encourage you not just to check a box, but to spend regular extended time in the scriptures. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm busy. I don't have time to spend regular extended time in the scriptures. Let me encourage you that you do. What's your dead air time like? We have a lot of dead air in our lives that we fill with other things. What do you listen to while you're driving around? Bluetooth speakers are easy to, easy to come by these days, right? Put one in your bathroom. Listen to a sermon while you're taking a shower. I guarantee you, you got time there. There's nothing else that you're gonna be having to do other than just the rote cleaning, right? Fill your dead air with the word of God. Fill your mind with the scriptures. Meditate on God's word. Set reminders on your phone so that uh, scripture verses pop up throughout your day. Send text messages to other brothers to encourage them with the word. Spend that time in the word if you want to be a devoted follower of the Lord. And then third is, is friendship and fellowship. David had Jonathan. Who's your Jonathan? Who's going to be there to help you patiently trust in the Lord? Who's going to be there to walk with you through the trials? Who's going to be there with you to encourage you? Again, in the Psalms, so many times David was writing them in desperate times of his life. And yet over and over and over again, we see the steady devotion of the Lord coming back to the Lord saying, you are my rock, you are my stronghold, you are my fortress. I'm not gonna allow my trials to drive me away from you, but to you in devotion. Well, our final lesson from David's life actually has come from the DBR over the last couple of days. And that actually came from the DBR yesterday morning specifically. And we we're in first Kings and you're thinking, well, why are we now in 1 Kings? We're in 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel, and we've already got 55 chapters in 130 years. Why are you fast forwarding into 1 Kings? But how is David spoken of in 1 Kings? Well or poorly? Well. And it's so encouraging to read how 
he's recorded, how he's remembered. In fact, we have that moniker that we remember him by that's lifted from the pages of scripture, right? That David is a what? Man after God's own heart. Isn't that good news that we don't look at David and be like, David, the adulterer and the murderer? David, the arrogant, prideful guy who didn't trust the Lord? David, the lousy dad? I mean, we, we could pick, take our pick from all the sins, right? We're well acquainted with them after two years studying his life. And yet the way that David is remembered is that David is a man after God's own heart. And the reason for that is because that's the way that God chose to remember him. That's the way that God chose to put down in his word, in the scriptures, how we should remember David. First Kings chapter 14, verse eight. As God was through the prophet confronting Jeroboam through his wife, It says, and God tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet you have not been like my servant, David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. That's amazing that that's God's description of David. Not only for what we know of David, but you remember God is omniscient. God knew everything in David's life. God knew the sins that weren't recorded in the pages of God's word. And yet his description is, he kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. First Kings chapter 15. Again, this time in contrast to Abijam, another king. It says, and Abijam walked in all the sins that his father did before him and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. Holy true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem and set up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And that's really the only time we find reference to Uriah the Hittite after that. And it's thrown on there, but it's not the main focus. The main focus is David did what was right. God is contrasting the wicked and evil kings of Israel and Judah saying, they're not like David. Because David, he's saying, was a a man who was faithful a man who followed me with all of his heart. And we might say, yeah, but wait, but what about? But what God's communicating to us and what God is teaching us and what we need to rejoice in is God is saying, yes, but those sins were confessed and forgiven. And so David, in that confession and forgiveness, was fully restored. Our final point together this morning is this. See the power of forgiven sin. See the power of forgiven sin. A few names for you to think about. First one, Bill Buckner. Think Bill Buckner would like to know the power of a forgiven error? Yeah, I think so. If you guys are not a baseball fan, you're wondering why. Uh, 1986 World Series. Misplayed a ground ball that some would argue, although it's a seven-game series, cost the Red Sox the World Series. Continued the, the curse of the Bambino, right? And now that's been overturned because they've won a couple. But still, Bill Buckner, you think Bill Buckner, you think of his greatest failure. Or how about uh, another guy, Steve Bartman, 2003, Chicago Cubs were four outs away from going to their first ever, well, not their first ever, but their first National League pennant in over 100 years. The balls hit down the the left field foul line. Moises Alou was convinced he was going to catch that ball, but Steve Bartman, a fan who was on the foul line, reached out and interfered with the ball kept the game alive and the Cubs lost that game and went on to lose the series and missed out on the World Series yet again. Steve Bartman all of a sudden became the GOAT of the 2003 playoffs, but not the greatest of all time, the GOAT, the other GOAT that you don't want to be. And he was remembered for that and is still remembered for that. And you think of Steve Bartman's life and there's so much more in Steve Bartman's life or so much more in Bill Buckner's life and yet what are they remembered for? They're remembered for their greatest Failure. Praise God that Christianity is not that way. That you and I are not going to be remembered for our greatest failure, for our greatest sin, or even for our smallest sin. That God is not a God who's looking at us and 
identifying us as what our sins are, but he's looking at us, and if we are in Christ, he's looking at us, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as what a new creation. He's looking at us as forgiven. He's looking at us as cleansed and restored. And not only that, but now he's given us the opportunity to be used by him for his glory. He's given us the opportunity now and for every one of you in the room, there is still time for this, to have the resume that David had, to say that he was a man that followed the Lord with his whole heart and kept his commandments. The man of God you've always wanted to be, there's still time for you to be. There's a great movie, it's, it's called the, the Mission. And there's a scene in The Mission where there's a, a former Spanish conquistador, a soldier, who had committed all kinds of atrocities as he was in his former life. And a missionary comes along and, and teaches him about the Lord and is trying to, to share the gospel with him. And he's bringing him with him to, to reach a, a particular mission, a particular tribe in the jungle. And it's a densely forested rainforest, a, a jungle there. And, this conquistador is dragging behind him a net full of all of his armor. The, the, the heavy metal breast shield and helmet and, and, and sword, all of those things, all of this weight he's dragging with him as a reminder of his former life and all of the sins and all of the evil that he had done. And he's dragging it through the trees and through the forest and through everything else. And it's hard and it's laborious for him. And he's suffering under the weight of this. And then he comes to a waterfall and realizes that he's got to go up this waterfall. And he begins to climb and he's slipping and he's falling and he's, he's laboring to get up because he's dragging this weight with him the whole way until finally the missionary brings out his sword and he cuts the rope. And this dramatic scene, the, the bag full of all the armor goes tumbling down the mountain and down the waterfall never to be seen or carried again. That is the picture of what takes place with us at the moment of salvation. You're not dragging your sins with you in your life as a believer in Christ. You have been forgiven. You have been cleansed. You have been washed. You have been sanctified. And when you sin and when you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, forgive me, please, this was wrong. I'm repenting from this. He takes your sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west. He throws it into the shoreless sea, never to be drug up again. He doesn't add it to a bag and say, okay, you're forgiven, but carry around the shame and the guilt with you. Because Romans 8.1 makes it clear, there's therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Which is why God could say of David that he was a man after his his own heart. How encouraging is that for us? Your legacy has not been set in stone yet. No matter what your life has looked like to this point, as long as there is still this morning, still today, by God's grace, by God's mercy, there is time to live for the Lord, to be the man of God after his own heart, to be faithful, to be a, a man who is wholly devoted to the Lord. As long as there is, is today, as long as there is this moment, there is time to fight for that legacy. Where does the power to do that come from? It comes from the Lord having made us a new creation in Christ. This past weekend, I, I taught in our breakout session on sharing the gospel with those that are coming out of a same-sex lifestyle or those who are transgender. And so often that can seem like such a monumental task for us because we think to ourselves, well, they're never gonna walk away from that because it's so ingrained in them. But the sin that we've fallen into there is we expect sanctification to precede salvation because the, the key to change for any of us is regeneration. Once you have been born again, all bets are off. There's nothing that's impossible for the Lord at that point. Once you have been regenerated, given new life, then you have the power to overcome whatever sin is in front of you. You have the power to be a faithful man of God. The man of God you want to be, you can be. Because God's already done the heavy lifting in bringing you from death to life. And in dwelling you with his Holy Spirit. And enabling you to be that devoted follower of Christ. Well, as you think of the life of David, there's no doubt that some of you took away other lessons. And I'm sure they're just as, as good and, and applicable as the ones that we've covered together this morning. 
These are simply three lessons that as I was reflecting, as I was looking back over the life of David that I pulled out for us to think on, to reflect on together as we consider 55 chapters, 45 messages, 130 years, one God. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful, thankful for your word, thankful for the truth it conveys to us, the truth that it it instructs us, the truth that it teaches us. Thankful that things are recorded for us like the life of David. God, thankful that things are recorded for us like David's sin with Bathsheba and yet at the same time a statement that David was a man after your own heart. Statements that David was wholly devoted to you, that he followed you. God, it does remind us of the power of forgiven sin, the power of regeneration, the power of the new life that we have in Christ. And so Lord, I pray that if if any man is in here this morning discouraged because of past failures, that he would remember that in Christ he is forgiven, that those things have been paid for, atoned for, that there's no condemnation now in Christ Jesus, and that now there is freedom to walk in obedience to you, not hanging a a tag of our sin that we struggle with or that we uh, have been beset with in the past behind us, but hanging behind us the tag of, of forgiven, freed, so that we can walk in faithful obedience to you. God, may we be found as those types of men. For your glory and your honor in Christ's name, amen.